Welcome back to Activista Rise Up. I am your host, Dr. Patricia Campos Medina. You can listen to this podcast by following me on all my social media platforms. Activista Rise Up is about leaders, what inspires them to take action and what keeps them going. By listening to their stories, we hope to inspire you to take action. Today, I am excited to introduce to you Odilia Romero, the co-founder of an organization in Los Angeles, California called Cielo, Comunidades Indígenas en Liderazgo. Odilia founded Cielo to make sure that the needs of indigenous Mayan women migrants from Mexico and Central America were being met. Cielo focuses on addressing the needs of immigrant migrant women with programming around issues of gender violence prevention, language justice, healthcare access, and cultural preservation, instilling in migrant women pride in their language and in their culture. The work of Cielo is so important that Liso introduced her work to her fans at the Billboard Awards and called on all of us to elevate the work that Cielo is doing, advancing and protecting the rights of indigenous Mayan women. Today, we welcome Odilia Romero to Activista Rise Up. Welcome, Odilia. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you, uh, Dr. Patricia. It's an honor. Para mí es un honor. For me, it's a pleasure to, to have you. I'm part of the Alianza America Network. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what is Cielo and how did it come about? Well, Cielo is an indigenous woman-led organization, and we specifically focus and very intentional about supporting indigenous young women, women leadership in this patriarchal society that has many challenges. Uh, but uh, here we are uh, taking a dab at it, trying to figure out how can we as Cielo support indigenous women, indigenous youth. Um, you know, we strongly believe like, uh, you know, our future as indigenous people are in indigenous women, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so Cielo is a human rights organization for indigenous people founded by my daughter and myself. Um, a few years ago, 2016, but we come from a long history of, um, of organizing to grassroots. Um, so our, our experience with working with indigenous people is more than 20 years, right? My daughter was, was born in this movement of indigenous people's rights. So, um, but, but we wanted to create something very specific for women. Uh, like I said, we live in a patriarchal society. And, you know, a lot of the leadership are men, but not enough women. Uh, so we wanted to create that space. So in Mexico, there's 60 indigenous language families and more than 22 in Guatemala, right? And there's over 100 uh, Mesoamerican languages. And if we go to Nicaragua, to Costa Rica, there are indigenous people still in Central America and South America, right? So, uh, but because we're so close to the border, a lot of our work has to do with Guatemala and uh, Central America and Mexico. But that assumption leads to human rights violations. Because when the assumption is that we all speak Spanish, all the services are given in Spanish. And, that, and very few people know that there's indigenous languages spoken still in the, in, at this time in 2023 here in the United States that are from Mexico and Guatemala, right? Yeah. So um, that is one that is like the erasure of our existence in data, in language, and the labeling of us from being Mexican, Guatemalan, to being Latino, Hispano, uh, you know, that all caused it's um, deadly because when there is that assumption, if I'm in a hospital and I need to make a life and death decision for my child, for my parents, for myself, and the instructions are given to me in Spanish, you know, I am not going to make an informed decision. Yeah. Right? Or if I'm in a court of law, if I'm in an immigration court, how do I increase my chances of asylum? How do I say I am running from these companies that are pushing us out, people that are taking companies that are taking our water, our land? How am I running from these African palm oil companies? Right. I can't say that if there's no interpretation, if there's no information in my language. Therefore, for us at Cielo, access to an interpreter is a human right. It's a fundamental right. Without that, without a language, without information in your language, it's a violation of your human rights. And then, of course, these narratives contribute to language violence against indigenous peoples. Yes. 
and it makes me think about even the um, the discrimination that you must feel from even other other Latinos who don't understand that this exclusion of language and recognition of indigenous culture. I mean, it's, it's I mean it's a continuation of the discrimination and the colonization that uh, this sense of um, that we're all Latinos and there's not indigenous that 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 you know I am from El Salvador I. I come from the area of El Salvador where there's a long history of the Olmeca and the Pipil people. And if I, I were to go back into my history, you could, you know, you could trace it back to that culture. Although in, in places, in most places in Central America, the erasure of indigeneity has been forced. So I, you know, there's still this uh, sense of discrimination from even uh, our own people that they say, well, you know, we're not indigenous or, or, or we don't have indigenous in our, in our community. So how do you manage that level of discrimination from their own Latino community who wants to erase the indigeneity of our ancestors and in our culture? Because it comes, you know, even El Salvador, we, you know, there's a long history. And still, there is indigenous people who live in the land uh, in the way of the ancestors. How do we deal with it? I mean, we've been resisting for 530 plus years, and we're gonna to continue to resist, right? Unfortunately, we have to be resistant and resilient. I wish we had one day of peace where we didn't have to resist and we didn't have to be resilient and just live in, in peace, right? But that's not the case, especially for us who have migrated. We constantly have to be educating people about our existence. Indigenous people continue to live today. There are so many languages. In LA County, we've identified 17 indigenous language families that are spoken. And, you know, we serve uh, 23 states with language services. So we know that in 23 states for a fact that there's indigenous people. But we also know that other 25, 20, how many are we, 50? Um, <laughs> you know, the other 24, 25, you know, are 27. Um, they are indigenous people, right? So we constantly have to be educating um, our relative from the immigrant rights movement, our, our, our Latino relative, and make it very clear, like, yeah, we, we could be in alliances, but it has to be a respectful alliance. Uh, and wearing our traditional regalia doesn't mean solidarity. Solidarity is when you, as an immigrant rights organization, provide interpretation services in the language. If you're having to know your rights and there's one indigenous person, and you're not providing an interpreter for that one person because it doesn't fit into your budget, then you're contributing to the violence of indigenous people. And I just had this conversation yesterday, actually, by someone that said, well, I can't justify hiring an interpreter. There's only five Kiche interpreters, five Kiche people attending the workshop. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, even if it was one, you still need to provide interpretation services. And they're like, no, because, you know, it's costly and it's only five people. And, yes. and then that's the math that they do, right? Oh, uh, the Yankees have water. We'll take away their water because there's only 40,000 of them. It's going to benefit a million people in Hermosillo. Or yeah. we're going to take away this land from the Kekchi because it's going to benefit so many people in the world. They're only 5,000 of them. So I think this map is also contributes to violence against indigenous people. How like, we don't have a budget because it's just five. I mean, we could sacrifice five. They don't need to know your rights as long as the other 50 participants know their rights. So this is how people make decisions about indigenous people's rights. And it's quite violent, you know? I like the framework that you are placing in how we must be conscious about the services that we're providing and making sure that we don't exclude anybody. Uh, so part of language justice is actually making sure that everybody understands what's happening and, pro and figuring out that we have funding to provide those services to everyone. And we demand that from our funders, even whether it be from philanthropy or from government agencies that they ought to fund so that information is in every language. How are you preserving the understanding of that language? Because I know uh, universities in California now teaching again indigenous language. So how are you preserving the maintenance and the reteaching of the language so that we all have more awareness about that, the need? Well, we have a classes that we give during the summer, which is uh, Zapoteco, uh, Mixteco, and Maya Yucateco. 
Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I know that universities teach Nahuatl, but in the case of LA, I mean, they should be teaching Quiche. Uh, Nahuatl is very important. It's a very important language. And there's a small population here um, that speak that language. But the largest population we have is Quiche, Zapoteco, Canjobal, Chinanteco, right? So we have in Maya Yucateco. So we're trying to, we are giving the classes because all our, all our, oh, Cielo is here to serve the community from providing classes to having a literature conference. Indigenous literature conference coming up in a few months. And that is in downtown LA, is not a university because we want people to have access to that poetry, right, of their people. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of our services goes to serving the community and for the community to have access to the classes, to the literature conference, to the interpreters conference, where it's uh, accessibility is everything. With all this anti-immigrant uh, backlash that we're seeing on the border and the high levels of family separation and separation of, in, of, of immigrants from all over, you know, from Latin America, but from Guatemala and El Salvador and Mexico, um, I know that you do, do, do have a program that is called um, Cuidar es Curar and, and, and addressing some of the issues that are faced by young women of indigenous descent who get caught in the immigration nightmare of detention. So can you share a little bit about that program and how could people who are uh, trying to address the issue of family separation, how can they uh, share your experiences and learn from your experience so they can also address the needs of young, young men and women who get separated and are perhaps of indigenous um, uh, descent and don't have the ability to communicate dire directly in Spanish or English? Well, that program is in partnership with Alianza de las Americas. And you know that that is a campaign that they're running that we're in, in partnership with. But I think, well, no, no I, I don't think, I'm sure. <laughs> I need to realize the contribution of the migrants and displaced people here and back home. You know, the fact that you're taking away the Kekchi land by producing palm oils or mining or taking away the water of indigenous people, you know, you're benefiting from that displacement. These corporations are benefiting from this displacement. But here, once we're here, we're criminalized, we're incarcerated. A corporation is being benefiting from our incarceration, right? But then once we're out of those centers, uh, we're working in the agricultural field, we are working in the pack meat packing industry. We're contributing there too. And then we send money home. So I think people need to realize that we contribute to the economy of multiple countries in multiple ways with our multilingual veins as indigenous people. I also know that you do a lot of education and training around issues of gender violence. How is this, why is this a core issue that you uh, deal with uh, at Cielo and in what ways are you addressing that issue? Well, a lot of our work has to do with um, educating service providers from law enforcement to social workers to within the movement is the root cause of migration of indigenous people. What are the root cause, right? But also recognizing that we are in indigenous territory because we tend to forget and we say, this is a country of immigrants, I'm sorry, but hey, the rightful owners of these land continue to live in these land, right? Um, so we do a lot of that education about the different struggles of indigenous people uh, here in uh, the root causes, how to identify the languages, and also uh, how to better serve indigenous people and how do you become an ally of indigenous people without having a paternalistic attitude about it as well. So uh, we do that training. We have them uh, across the nation, online, in person. So a lot of our work has to do with educating and informing people about the root cause of displacement of indigenous people. So you can support by sharing our work. We have a social media, follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, in Instagram, LinkedIn. Follow us there, share our work. We have a donate button in our webpage. Yes. And not everybody has not everything has to do with money, right? Disability is important. So uh, if you can donate, please go ahead. We have a tax deductible uh, webpage, but also share our work. Share our work 
um, make it viral, make a, a viral tweet, a viral Instagram, um, so that people know that we are here, we're resistance as indigenous people across the U.S. What is your own story that got you to organize this work and, and make it so visible in Los Angeles, in a place that we all think is now, it's a Latino city, it's a Latino town, and they ought to be more inclusive of everybody, but we're still all trying to figure out what that inclusiveness looks like. So what, what got you inspired to start Cielo? I, I, well, I, well, I came here to, in, in, to the U.S. at the age of 10, only being monolingual, speaking only Spanish, and not Spanish, I'm sorry, speaking only Zapoteco, uh, not knowing Spanish, uh, only a few words, nothing in English, and having to encounter a whole different culture, two different languages at the same time, was very traumatic for me, right? As I went to school, people assumed that I was a Mexicana, a Latina, and they automatically placed me in classes that I was not understanding. I fell through, oh, I actually never passed a class. They kept on passing me. And that is, we're talking about 42 years ago. It happens today in the di school districts across the U.S. where people get confused as Latinos, Hispanos, Guatemalans, Mexicans, and there's no attention to that it's a language barrier that this child is facing. All those kids that were at the detention center are in a school somewhere. Yes. Yeah. And they all are being left behind because of the language. So language is very personal to me uh, because I was that kid. I was that kid that was excluded because of language in many things, right? I was that kid that faced the racism and discrimination by other Latinos, by by Mexicanos, uh, and and it's um it's it's personal, uh, you know. And because it's personal, is what we created Cielo. You know, we like I said, we belong to other organ political or indigenous organization, which was like our political formation there. But uh, creating an organization, woman led, with investment in young women, is something that we wanted to do because there is a need. There is a need, but there's also a lot of talent uh, in, in the indigenous uh, movement, right? Like yeah. the case uh, the Cultura Cura uh, um, with the uh, Alianza de las Americas. Uh, we're going to put all the information um, about Cielo on our website on our and send it to all our supporters and encourage them all to continue to follow you and support the work that Cielo is doing to create language justice. Uh, for the indigenous community. So one last thing that you want to tell my listeners. Thank you so much for the time and follow us on social media, share our work, make our work viral. You know, the more people that know that we exist, the better it is to stop a language violence against indigenous people. Thank you so much for coming. And that was the purpose of bringing you to Activista Rise Up to talk a little bit about the work that you do and to raise the awareness of our listeners that there are people there are people like you putting uh, putting a face and putting the narratives of indigenous women front and center uh, so that we can address the issue of uh, language viol uh, language justice, which is if we are not aware of it, we're committing violence against, against indigenous folks. And I want to thank you for doing that work and uh, happy to support you and promote the work that you're doing. Thank, thank you. you. For yeah, muchísimas gracias. You heard it. Uh, our communities are diverse, and even within our Latino community, we have indigenous communities who have different needs, different languages, and we as, uh, as leaders need to be aware that by if we leave one person behind, we commit violence against that person's um, identity culture. Let's be more aware. Let's support organizations like Cielo who are creating awareness of the importance of language justice in the, in the work for immigrant justice. Thank you so much. Support Cielo and get engaged. Make a donation, go to their website, and if you have indigenous communities in your city, in your town, reach out to them, and they, might be, they will be able to make connections for you so that you can get the resources to engage uh, with those communities and be, bring everybody along in the work of social and economic and racial justice. This is Activista Rise Up. Thank you for joining us.